Norfolk Record Office is currently involved in a national project called Unlocking Our Sound Heritage that is working to save the nation's sound archives. Unlocking Our Sound Heritage is chaired by the British Library and supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Norfolk Record Office is the East of England Unlocking Our Sound Heritage Hub, working as one of 10 UK-wide heritage organisations to digitally preserve rare and at-risk audio archives. Sound archives hold fascinating insights into our collective and cultural history, from music, broadcasts, interviews, sounds of nature, machinery and much more. These audio recordings document first-hand a place, event or time period. They capture dialect, storytelling and emotion. Yet sound archives are at risk. From natural physical deterioration, as the sound carriers degrade over time, and technical obsolescence, as old, outdated formats cease to be manufactured and the playback equipment necessary to play their recordings disappear from production. By ensuring that sound archives are correctly preserved and maintained, and by creating digital copies of rare and at-risk recordings, unlocking our sound heritage is ensuring that historically valuable recordings are safeguarded for future generations, and made accessible for audiences today. To date, the project has successfully preserved over 250,000 sound recordings nationwide. As the East of England Unlocking Our Sound Heritage Hub, Norfolk Record Office works with sound archives from across the Eastland counties, including those of East Anglia. In today's talk, I will be guiding you through some examples of recordings that have been preserved at Norfolk Record Office, and have your snacks at the ready as this talk will focus on food, with memories of mealtimes, sounds of the food shop, and reminiscences of the heart of the home, the kitchen. And this is where we will begin, in the kitchen. Many of the sound recordings that we work with through the Unlocking Our Sound Heritage Project are what we would call oral histories. These are recorded interviews with everyday people, recounting their lives, their childhoods, their working life, or their experience of certain events and time periods. Many of these include first-hand fascinating insights into what life was like during the late 19th century and the early 20th century. To begin, we'll start with some audio appetisers from Norfolk Kitchens. Let's have a listen to what's on the menu. Now there used to be a thing called kettle broth, oh, or plump. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be, you'd get a basin, and you'd cut a thick piece of bread, and you'd put that in the basin, and you'd boil a kettle of some water in a kettle, and you'd pour that on, as soon as that boiled, you'd pour that on the bread, then you'd put a piece of margarine in it, salt and pepper, then you'd eat it. Mm. That was called kettle broth or plump. Mm. Now, that used to fill people up. Mm -hmm. There's many a man who had that for his supper. We used to have pigs fry for dinner, Fridays, uh, slices of uh, slices of onion, then the, the meat, and then the potatoes. You all run this big tin. Then Norfolk dumplings with the gravy. And I hear a lot about these Norfolk dumplings. Okay. What's the recipe for these? Just like bread. You know how they make bread with yeast? Mm. You, have, you make Norfolk dumplings with yeast. Oh, and they're about as big as that, aren't they? Yeah, I used to do it too. Yeah. Mm. I know it used to be called dog, no, mm. uh, dumpling scoffer. Because <laughs> I'd always eat two or one and a half, always. Yes, mm. that's right. Because yeah. they were so near, because you'd have it with your gravy. Then you have your meat and the vegetables mean. after. Oh, as, you as, have as, that as, first. Mm. first yeah. And then you could get a pound of pig's fry and have that, that slug of the dumplings on, so it's just mm. yeah. on that. There are many things that we take for granted in the modern kitchen from our culinary gadgets and gizmos to our commonplace appliances and white goods that would have marvelled families in the early 20th century. As well as the convenience of some of the most staple foods such as the simple shop-bought block of butter. In this next clip we'll hear a woman describing the traditional method for churning butter which she assisted her mother with during her childhood. Could you, could you tell me how, how she made the butter? 
Well, of course, so the, in the first place, the, the churn was all scalded out with boiling water to make sure that was quite clean. What, well, what, what sort of churn was it? Oh, so great big round a, barrel a, a shaped barrel one. Churn, yes, with yeah. the, the handle at the end. And we didn't have any separator in them days. Uh, the, the milk was to be put in flat cans, you see. Then Mother used to go around with what she called a flute, a little flat thing with holes all in, to skim the cream off, mm. and put it in these parts, these earthenware parts. They were earthenware outside but glazed inside, you know the type. Well, then, of course, all this cream was put in there. Was it yeah. kept for a week? I've heard for a week, yes, always for a week. Day. Yes, yes. Yeah. They'd skim it, not uh, day to day's milk, they would skim that tomorrow, like you see. Ah, yes. When the cream had all been nicely yes. set. Yes. And of course, the milk that was left went into the swill tub to feed the pigs on. Well, then, uh, I think the, the cream was put in the, this churn, you see. And then, of course, we had to turn it, because we, we would be cross, we didn't like to do it, so we'd gallop it around, you know. Mother used to say, well, no, you mustn't do that, you must do it. The one stroke, you see, if uh, if you'd gone too quickly, the butter would have come too quick, and then that had been all crumbly, you see. Oh, yes, yes. So we had to do it the steady stroke. And you could, uh, as you turned it, you'd feel it change, and you'd feel the weight got different, you see. Yes, yes. And then Mother used to come and take the cork out every little while to let the air out, you see. Mm. And then when the butter, the butter had come, we used to leave it for a little while. Then she used to have a great big pan of water. She'd bring this butter out into this pan of water and work it all out, you know, to work it, the milk all out. Then she'd have it in another pan where she added the salt, and then she'd work it all in the salt, and that'd be made into pats. We used to like to run the, a little thing, you know, with a mark on a thistle mother had. We used to run that up and down. Yeah. Some flat ones she made, and that had a carrot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is butter without a good slice of bread? In this next selection of clips, we turn to memories of baking, from loaves of bread to large cakes to feed the whole family. Yeah. Tell us about making the bread at home, because it must have had to be made in big quantities. The old lady, she used to, um, to make it Friday nights, yeah. bake it Saturday mornings every week. And she used to, I used to have to get it all ready for her, and she had a great big bowl. What was it, a wooden or um, a, a earthenware? Like bowl? a milk pan, you see, yes. big milk, one of our milk pans, she used to make it in. Mm. And she used to use a lot of flour and, and yeast, and she always used to, you know, I used to have to boil the sauce and potatoes. Mass them up right fine every night out, and she used to always put a few potatoes in her bread. She's the only one I ever remember doing that. Well, I've read the recipe for doing that, and I couldn't imagine what it was like. What was the bread? Did was the bread nice? Oh yes, the homemade bread. I like homemade bread, mm. but uh, that was nice. I didn't know it was any difference, but I never seen anybody put potatoes in because, as a rule, you make it with so much yeast to the flour and. You uh, make a hole in the flour and you mix your yeast up with warm water and a little sugar and uh, you push it in the middle and you knead it all in with warm water, just lukewarm water, to get a great big lump and you knead it and knead it and knead it, keep on till that's all together. And you put it in this pan and you cover it up with a I used to put a big old, nice t clean tablecloth right over and lay a cushion on the top or something, double it up a big blanket or something, keep it warm until it rose right up to the top. I used to cut it up in pieces and put it in the tins, two pound tins, and make a line like that in it. And I used to stand it again and let it rise just to the top of the tin. And I used to make twice a week when I had my family, the old cooking stuff we had here then. I used to make up about six loaves twice a week for my six children, myself. We always had homemade bread, always. We used to put it in and just, you know, watch it and it used to get nice and brown. But now, it used to be lovely. I used to get up mornings and I had all my children cook them hot bread for breakfast. Did you? Yeah, I used to get up about six and half past and I used to call them. I used to say, come on, the bread's nearly cooked. <laughs> they, they'd all come down and wash and get ready and get round the table, nice hot bread and butter. And then she used to make long cakes, you know. Yeah. They were special harvest cakes, were they? They were, yes. 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 What were they made of? Just fruit, you know, they all lard it. They were made with lard and the flour and sugar, of course, and then the fruit, the sultanas and currants and things. Yes, like. and they were long, flat cakes. Long, flat cakes, yes. Yes, yes. Easy to cut. Oh, easy to cut, yes. Yes, yes. 
Was that the only time of year that that cake was made? Especially no, uh, Mother usually had some in the cupboard, you see, because yes. the farm men used to have a glass of milk and a slice of cake yes. during the morning, you yes. see. But it was always called harvest cake. That's right, yes. 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 At that time of day, you know, my mother used to do all the baking herself. Did she? And she used to make a cake for us, what we used to call, we used to call them a curran short cake. Well, that used to be, I should think, what, two foot six to three foot long and about two foot wide. I used to have to carry it on my head. Go up and just have to take up the baker. Oh, yes. And the yeah. baker used to bake it for me, The speaker in this last clip was James Henry Brown, who was born in 1895. In his childhood reminiscence that we've just heard about the giant currant shortcakes that his mother used to make, he describes how he would have to carry them on his head and take them up to the baker's shop, where it was baked in the baker's oven. By today's practices, this seems unusual, but it was not just the sheer size of this particular shortcake that required a larger oven. It was in fact commonplace for bakeries to cook all sorts of food on behalf of the families in their surrounding community. The domestic oven began in the form of coal-fired ovens available from the early 1800s, but only initially affordable by the affluent classes. Many lower economic classes still cooked using a traditional method of a pot suspended over an open grate, and with no facility for baking, the local bakery was the only place that families could bake or roast food. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, coal-fired ovens began to be replaced by early gas ovens, and black cast iron stoves began to become more commonplace within the average home. However, as is mentioned in one of the clips that you were about to hear, many average families paid for their gas on a metre, and so it still remained a common practice to do longer baking or roasting at the baker's shop. Yes, we used to have a whole gas cooker, and of course my mother, like the men the old um, neighbours, used to rely on the gas man to come round to empty the meter, because it's penny meters, mm -hmm. and put a penny in for, to cook a dinner. And uh, Sundays, they'd all take the, the dinners in the meat tin down to the baker's shop. Because he that the uh, the oven would still be hot after he'd done his loaves, mm -hmm. and he used to put all the meat in the tin. You know, the neighbours mm -hmm. come put mm -hmm. the meat in the tins, take it down there to cook. Mm. He's cooking for him for a penny. Oh. See, yeah. that's one way of getting. It. He used to be our baker, Hayden, but and then of course they used to cook all the people's. Dinners. Oh yes, someone else. Christmas Day, that. yes. Yeah. And what, what, did this happen every Sunday? Every Sunday yeah. they'd cook, yeah. and of course Christmas Day they used to cook the whole dinner. But there again, you see, we never had turkeys in those days, no, nothing like no. that. They'd have tame rabbit. The majority of people had tame rabbits Christmas Day. Mm. Also, they used to take the big jars of apples, mm -hmm. baked apples, mm -hmm. they or windfalls. And you'd put them in a stone jar and then they'd pop them in the oven and they'd stay there overnight. And, and they'd pay the baker a certain amount. And then you paid, yeah, the mm -hmm. baker for it. Oh, mm. that was really, you know, super. Mm. They was it because people didn't have ovens of their own? Well, or, no, we or, didn't really have the oven mm. because, I mean, say, when, well, they were old black. I mean, so when we lived in the shipyard, we had an old, my mother had an old black oven. Now that we've paid a visit to the baker's shop, it's probably time to explore some other food shopping habits. Today we can purchase almost anything we desire online and have it delivered direct to our door, or browse the aisles of a supermarket where everything is available under one roof. The UK's first self-service style supermarket was opened in London in January 1948. Although these shops were small by the standards of today's superstores, this autonomous method for food shopping, deriving from the cultural influence of America, was highly unusual for British consumers, who had previously been used to the social exchange of shopping, the interaction with each individual shopkeeper or market stall holder, who would gather, weigh out and bag up each item from a customer's list. In this next selection of sound clips, we will hear memories of food shopping at the turn of the 20th century beginning with door-to-door -door sellers and traditional food shops in Great Yarmouth, and then exploring Norwich Market and its surrounding area. 
It used to be a boy come round in the morning, young Archie. He had a big basket on his arm full of hot rolls and he'd ring a bell as he came along and he'd run out and buy these hot rolls. I think they were a penny each for breakfast. Mm. What sort of things would you have for breakfast in those days? Well, what we could catch, old <laughs> love. We have had, we have had a round of bread with some tea poured on and a couple of spoonfuls of sugar on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to have to go coo up for two pence a stale of pastries. Yeah. I used to have to go up before I went to school, stand outside the pastry shop with a lot more, and uh, fast they got the best. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we said to get two pounds of scalies. We put there'd be enough for all on us. From there I got the maple, pound of margarine, fortunes. Yeah, fortunes a pound. Then I'd come back and go to Golders in Middlegate Street and when you went, went there for a loaf of bread they used to wear. Yes, they so you'd get a loaf and a piece. Mm. Well if I was hungry I'd eat the piece before I got home. No. These Saturdays for us kids was a we used to go on the kettle on on the fruit mark on the you know, on the walk, and there'd be all the stalls there with lit repairs and lamps and that. And um, we'd go there with our barrows, we'd make our own barrows, and we'd go there and get orange boxes mm. to chop up for firewood to sell. Mm. And we'd rummage amongst the orange boxes and, and get the spots. Yeah. There'd be the spotted oranges where you didn't yeah. sell. Oh, yes. We'd eat them. Oh. And then we'd Going to the arc, uh, not the arcade, Davy Place, where Ashworth and Pike's cake shop is, yes. or was, and we'd walk in there with a carrier bag and ask for a three pounds of stale pastry. Mm. And they'd fill up that, uh, that carrier bag full of pastry. Mm. All fresh stuff, which, which they wouldn't do today. No. Them days, they had to get rid of it on the Saturday. They weren't allowed to sell it or keep it till mm. the Monday to mm. sell again. Mm. And we'd go there and that'd be our treat. Mm. Well, it would be beautiful cakes, you know, mm. cream ones mm. and mm. pies and something. That'd be our treat. This last selection of clips touched on poverty and how this affected the speaker's diets. With descriptions of purchasing stale pastries, searching for spotted oranges discarded by market sellers and eating tea-soaked bread as a main meal. Food poverty and shortage are subjects that are very common in many of the oral history recordings that we have worked with through Unlocking Our Sound Heritage. And we have many accounts of people recollecting their childhood memories of working-class poverty at the turn of the 20th century, and the later decades leading to the rationing of food during the Second World War. In this next selection of clips, we will hear accounts of how people adapted their diets to shortages of food, beginning with the turn of the 20th century, followed by the effects of the First World War. We were fortunate enough, when you could cook, you always fed your family well. Yeah. I mean, to say my mother used to make things out of nothing, as the saying was. Mm. I mean, to say an old meat bowl, and she'd make a beautiful stew mm. out of it. Mm. And then what sort of a meal would you have in the evening? If you had half a red heron and a slice, quick slice of bread, mind you, the thicker the slice, the better. If you were going to go to have one slice of bread each, if that was all there was in the house, well, you weren't that <laughs> <slice> thick. <laughs> and a half a red heron, that was a luxurious tea. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have half a red herring, what would it be then? Well, that would be just bread. Mm. Perhaps bread and butter or bread and lard or anything of that sort. Three parts of your food, you know, that time of the day, what you existed on was raw, mm. uncooked. That was the best of it. You got the poor stuff. Mm. Raw potatoes, raw cabbages, raw lettuces, raw onions, raw fruit. You eat potatoes raw as well? Yes, really? potatoes raw, mm. new potatoes raw, sweet as a nut. And there's nothing better than a raw uh, cabbage, because yeah. some used to have sugar with it. Mm. Then there was the hedgerows, when they come along, they were all poor, mm. clean. You couldn't eat the stuff now because it's putrefied with uh, chemicals mm. and uh, motor exhaust. During the war, I remember the, the biscuits they brought out. They were the same as sold in the trenches, I remember them. And they were like uh, giant dog biscuits, square dog biscuits. And they were hard, they were so hard you'd, you'd have to break them with a hammer. 
as the origin of what they called iron rations, you see, because they was hard as bloody iron. <laughs> Of course, in them days, we were always hungry, and everybody was hungry. No matter whether you're rich or poor, you were always hungry. You never got enough. We used to go after hawthorn berries, bottom berries, which fondly imagined they were they were tasted of butter. <laughs> so as far as I can remember, they were just really horrible, but we were glad to get them. I have eaten, uh, eaten acorns when I was hungry. Following the outbreak of the Second World War, in January 1940, the British government introduced rationing to ensure a fair distribution of food and commodities. Individuals were issued with ration books, dictating the amount of each product that they were able to purchase at a time. Rationing continued for many years after the end of the war, finally ending in 1954. In the following clips, we will hear two people recounting their childhood memories of the reintroduction of some of their favourite treats. Well, I remember when sweets went off ration, absolutely gorged ourselves. <laughs> and I, I, it was ever so late. I mean, I was in junior school when they went off ration. In the 50s, it was really late. But I remember the day they went off war, you could go and buy as many sweets as you like, because I had a very sweet tooth. I know, certainly in the late to uh, 40s there was an attempt to bring ice cream back onto the front and that was dreadful stuff because that was made with flour a little sugar and water and they used to freeze it and put it in these little tiny what today are known as hooky pooky glasses they're tiny glasses and they used to look oh you got a lot but actually there was only a tiny sort of spoonful teaspoonful in them penny licks i think they used to call them before the war uh, but it was horrible stuff Sound archives personify history, allowing us to travel back in time through the recorded memories of individuals who have experienced a version of our world, our county and our local area that is often far removed from that which we ourselves are familiar with today. From their experiences of particular events or time periods to changes in culture and society. I hope that this talk has worked up your appetite to think about your own food memories perhaps a favourite childhood meal, a dreaded school dinner, or a parent's signature dish. To end this talk, we will wash down all of the food-filled clips that we've ingested with a recollection of home-brewed beer from a Norfolk man who recounts his memories of working on a farm. However, don't be too quick to raise a glass, as the beer may not be what you bargained for. Years ago, nearly everybody used to brew their own beer. Well, we had an old fellow whacked on the farm. His wife could brew real good beer. And he was a very popular old fellow. He'd never give any away, and nobody looked him much. Well, one morning, I was up at the back of the wagon, and I see him a-coming there, another old fellow to whack. He got his old freight baskets I had on the back, and a half a gallon bottle slung in the front on him, home-brewed. That's what he used to bring to whack every day. Well, when he got up to the wagon lodge, he said to this other old bloke, Hold you on a minute, he said, Oh, you shouldn't want this beer up the field today. I got some from yesterday. That was cold, and I didn't drink it all, so I'll put her in here. So he climbed up here an old wagon we didn't use much, stood her up the corner, and covered her up in an old sack. He didn't know I see him. Well, that got out right hot during the day, and I was walking about him on the yards, and there was a young fella, a yardman there, I say to him during that afternoon, Oh, Yanni, are you dry? Ah, I was thinking of him, he say. I say, would you like a nice draught of beer? Well, yes, there I would, he say. I say, come you along me then. I went up at this climb bit this old wagon, and I got the bottle out. I say, hey, I hear a good pull. So he had a good pull of this hair bottle, and so did I. God, I said, it was a drop of good stuff, wasn't he? So he didn't know you brewed beer. I said, I don't. He said, whose is it then? And I told him. God, my heart, he cheated. He said, God, he said, he'll kill us. We know we've been out of his beer. Oh, he said, you don't know. What you got to do then? I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I took the old bottle out of the pit, the harsh pit. I didn't roll the water up. I dropped the old bottle in. I filled her up with water out of the harsh pit. Oh, he said, he say, he'll know. I said, I don't think I will. We'll see. So I put her back into the wagon and I just laid the cork on the top and covered it up again. I say, we'll see when he come up tonight. So we got her back to the cat to the wagon lodge. Why he come? He said, wait a minute, he said, I'll have a drop of beer before I go home. He said, this other bloke walked along with him. So he climbed up into the wagon. Soon as I turned up the door, he began to swear. I knew that happened. He said, he said, what? God damn it. He said, I should have tied that cork in there. 
That was a new brew and swalking that up here all the way this morning that there cock blew out. All that shit has gone flat. He got out. He got up his mouth and goggle, goggle, goggle. He was going. He, he slipped about a point and a half out in time. He said, oh, do you want any? He said, no, thank you. He said, I don't want any. He said, that is gone flat. Flat as anything. Still, never mind, he said. You know, there's no bad beer. Some is better than others. He never did find out that we filled it up out of the hospital. A good job he did. Well, I know we shouldn't have done it, but there you are.